Dr. Lee is a assistant professor of nutritional medicine at the Celiac Disease Center at the Health Center of Columbia University in New York. She's had a distinguished career as a clinical and private practice dietitian and was the nutritional services manager for Dr. Shar USA from 2008 until 2016, at which point she moved into academia full time. Dr. Lee has been involved with the Society for the Study of Celiac Disease since 2014. She's a reviewer for several scientific journals and has herself authored or co-authored numerous academic research papers and several book chapters. Her research topics include the nutritional quality of the gluten-free diet, the impact of the gluten-free diet on quality of life, and the impact on social behavior. Dr. Lee, uh, welcome to you. So what I'd like to do today is we're going to talk about living gluten-free. And as the previous speaker noted, Following a gluten-free diet not only is hard, but there are challenges too. And whether you have celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, we have lots of recommendations and things that we really need to be aware of in making sure that we not only do the diet gluten-free, but we do it well. Um, my disclosures are listed there. Uh, you can see the outline. So in terms of what we're going to be talking about, we need to think about the gluten-free diet in perspective. We know that the gluten-free diet is the only treatment for someone with celiac disease, but that's only about 1% of the population. Yet we have seen over time such an astronomical growth in the gluten-free market. And we can see that that's really being driven by not just those patients with celiac, but those patients that have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, IBS, there's several of the people that have begun to follow the gluten-free diet without a diagnosis of celiac disease because they find benefits from it, whether they're symptomatic from a GI point of view, or as was mentioned before, from a neuro neurological point of view. So let's dive in and kind of look at it. We're, we're gonna look at, I know you are familiar, but I thought, Let's do a little historical review. Celiac disease has been around for ages and ages. But interestingly, even though people were able to say there's something wrong with, with this group of people, we really don't know what it is. Um, it really took until the 1800s to really say it's something in the diet, but not until 1950s, really, do we find out exactly what it was that was causing the symptoms in those patients with, with celiac disease. Now we know it's an autoimmune re response to, to gluten, and we're actually beginning to finally see an increased rate of diagnosis. In terms of what celiac disease is, it is a autoimmune disease. It's based on a recessive gene. Not everyone in the family will get it. Um, it is, as we said, 1% of the population. One thing that's very important is once that gene is triggered, it's a diet for life. When we think of celiac disease, it's important to look at the diagnostic process. The first thing is a suspicion. And this is where many people go undiagnosed for many, many years, where many practitioners don't realize the wide spectrum of presentation. It can be anything from those, you know, weight loss, diarrhea, those very common classic symptoms to migraines, joint pain, or even failure to grow. It can also include things that Dr. Hagelin talked about too, brain fog, you know, um, ataxia, bone pain, many of these things. The proper diagnostic pathway for celiac disease is to start with a blood test. Gold standard for adults is still an endoscopy. And again, the treatment is the gluten-free diet. And why I wanted to emphasize that is because we wanna to talk today um, I was asked to talk today a lot about, you know, non-celiac gluten sensitivity and the diet approach for that. And even though we're going to be kind of focusing on non-celiac gluten sensitivity, a lot of the diet information also applies to anyone on the gluten-free diet, including our celiacs. Important to note and to distinguish between non-celiac gluten sensitivity and celiac disease itself is non-celiac gluten sensitivity is not an autoimmune reaction or allergic reaction. It is an innate immune response disorder. There is an inflammatory response that is triggered, but it's not genetically mediated and it's not an autoimmune. Um, people can present with very nonspecific symptoms that resemble celiac disease or wheat allergy, or they could be vastly different with neurological presentations. Also interesting is that with many people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, our 
often misdiagnosed as having IBS often, and we need to distinguish between the two. A lot of the symptoms that we see in non-celiac gluten sensitivity are some of the very common GI symptoms of bloating, abdominal pain, you know, nausea, reflux, but we also see a lot of joint and muscle pain, numbness, um, anxiety, depression, headaches, and fatigue. So it can present very, very differently um, in many, many different people. One thing that's important is to look at the diagnostic process and how that is different than the diagnostic process for celiac disease. The Salerno expert meeting actually came out with a with a step-by-step uh, -step process of the appropriate way to diagnose non-celiac gluten sensitivity. First, it would be very important to exclude wheat allergy and celiac disease first. So that would be that blood test, possibly endoscopy, to make sure that it's, it's not a, a celiac disease or not wheat allergy. Then we would have those patients make sure that they are eating a gluten-containing diet for at least six weeks. And again, the question that you had, Mark, about the impact of doing that gluten challenge, it's not an extensive period of time, and it's the only way we would really be able to assess how people are responding. Um, at the baseline visit, they would a patient would report symptoms. We would um, administer the, the gastrointestinal symptom rating scale. Then we would have a gluten-free diet for six weeks. And then we would record the difference in symptoms, the decrease in symptoms um, to be diagnosed as not celiac gluten sensitivity. We look to see a decrease of at least 30% off that baseline score in symptoms. Um, the most difficult part and not always followed through is to then go back on gluten and do that gluten challenge again to confirm the diagnosis. So it's a full on gluten diet, monitoring symptoms, going gluten free, looking at the change in symptoms, reintroducing gluten to, to make sure that those symptoms are there, that there's not some other component in the diet. If the symptoms improve, it's non-celiac gluten sensitivity. If there's no improvement, we need to do further testing to determine if it's IBS, if it's SIBO, lactose intolerance, fructose intolerance, or other FODMAP intolerances. The prevalence of non-celiac gluten sensitivity is not well studied and not well documented, but we estimate it's somewhere between 1 and 13% of the population. And I would put I would actually kind of caution that when we think about those of us who have been in the world of celiac disease for a long time, know that only 10, 15 years ago, we had similar reports for celiac disease where there was a wide variety, a wide range in the prevalence. We now have better diagnostic procedures for celiac disease. And I think that as we go to the future, we'll see better recording of non-celiac gluten sensitivity as well. The prevalence may be higher due to that low diagnostic rate. Um, and there is a lot of thought that really non-celiac gluten sensitivity may be more prevalent than celiac disease itself. Okay, what's important is that there may be many connections to, to non-celiac gluten sensitivity that even haven't been thought of yet, that haven't really been investigated. We need lots more research to really say, as Dr. Hogan said, what is the relationship to autism, to MS, to schizophrenia? Um, there's been some studies, but not many, and, and small numbers of participants. So we really do need to see what those connections are, but we need lots more research. So that brings us to this part of where, you know, my favorite part of, of this as a dietitian is the diet and to really focus on what can we do about the diet and how can we make it the best gluten-free diet possible. To do that, let's reflect back on a, on a wheat-based diet. In the U.S. and in Canada, a wheat-based diet is naturally, you know, everywhere. It's naturally high in fiber, B-complex vitamins. It offers taste, palatability, texture that is unique. Um, flour is, you know, both in Canada and the U.S., fortified or enri enriched to replace the minerals and nutrients that are lost during the processing of the grain from a full grain to a flour or to a product. Um, it's interesting and also concerning that special dietary products 
in both Canada and the US do not require that same enrichment or re-enrichment of the flours and the foods. So that typically a gluten-free bread is not as nutritionally dense as a wheat-based bread. So these are things to be, to be concerned about. So what are our diet recommendations? When we think of a gluten-free diet, for whatever reason you're using it, I always tell patients what we need to think about is not what we're taking out, but what foods are we going to put in? Again, looking to include those foods that may be anti-inflammatory, to include those foods that are going to provide those B vitamins, the iron and foods that you're missing by using gluten-free products. So obviously lots of fruits, vegetables, your calcium rich foods, your alternative grains. So we don't just rely on potatoes and rice, but we really include some interesting grains like teff and millet and such. When we think of the diet too, we often think about um, when we have symptoms, is it gluten related or could it be something else? And that's often something we also, when we're talking to our patients, want to really dive in and, and really kind of investigate. Because many people will say, oh, I went out to dinner and I got symptoms, so I know I got gluten. And I often caution that, you know, we, we can get symptoms from having gluten, but I also want to make sure that the symptoms you're recording aren't due to something else, that we really want to narrow it down and make sure that we look at that whole diet pattern and look at the different impacts of it. So the other, other possible causes of symptoms in non-celiac gluten sensitivity and even celiac disease could be the fiber content of the diet, could be the sugar content of the diet, or it could be the FODMAPs. And so we'll talk about each of these so we can really dive into them to see where they are. Where they are. The other thing is that in wheat, we, there are other non-gluten components of grains that we need to think about. The ATIs, which is the amylase tryptase inhibitors, are a family of proteins that are closely linked to Baker's asthma. They stimulate you know, that innate immunity, which is linked to non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And in some different studies, we found that the ATIs actually caused a great de degree of intestinal inflammation. There's also the wheat germ agglutinins, which are a family of carbohydrate, carbohydrates and binding proteins that are in the lectin group, again, linked to causing inflammation on the intestinal level. Um, and there's been several studies in mice that have seen an increase of that inflammation and also an increase of um, cytokines, which are related to inflammation as well. So besides just gluten, there's many other components that could cause those types of symptoms. Beyond those, Let's talk about fiber. When we think of a gluten-free diet, I, I'm gonna ask all of our celiac members here, how many of you are conscious of how much fiber you get in a day? And do you realize how much fiber we're supposed to have? An average adult should have between 25 and 30 grams of fiber per day. To give you a comparison, usual gluten-free bread has less than one gram of fiber, where a wheat-based bread could have two to three grams of fiber per slice. So we really need to be conscious of that. And the reason we need to be conscious of that, if you have your standard gluten-free diet and then enjoy a meal that has either a multi-grain gluten-free bread, more millet or teff or quinoa, we're gonna find that that change in fiber content will give you some of those gastrointestinal symptoms like bloating, abdominal pain, extra gas that we may think is gluten, where it's really a change in the fiber in the diet. And what fiber does is it really does help move things through the gastrointestinal tract. It actually makes the stools easier to pass. It bulks them. It really helps regulate normal bowel movements and such. And we need to be aware of a consistent amount of fiber in the diet. Okay. In practice, a low fiber diet can lead to constipation um, and that can cause some bloating and some gas in and of itself, especially if there's a big change. When we think of the gluten-free diet and you think of the different gluten-free products, what are they typically made of? It's tapioca, it's rice, it's potato. None of them have any fiber at all. The high fiber diet is what we would want to encourage our patients to have more of, but cautionally add them very slowly and monitor symptoms. Sugars can also cause symptoms in our patients. And when we think of the different kinds of sugars, there's lactose, fructose, 
and, you know, different um, sugar alcohols, which we'll get to in a minute, that in abundance can also lead to gas, bloating, and abdominal discomfort. In large amounts, these sugars can also lead to diarrhea, okay? High fructose corn syrup is added to many, many things. So anyone who is worried about the fructose content of their diet needs to really look at labels and read labels carefully. Um, important symptoms are dose dependent on all the sugars. In addition to the natural sugars that we have, there are also some sugar alcohols or manufactured sugars. And these are things like erythrol, hydrolated starch, hydro, hydro, hydrolysates, isol malt, mannitol. Important, these things are often added in many, many products. They're in throat lozenges, breath mints, they're in uh, low sugar beverages. They're added to many things. And those in large amounts will also cause great GI distress. They're linked to abdominal pain, um, pain and cramping and loose stools. The carbohydrates called polyols is another group that can also um, naturally occur in some fruits and veggies, but the amount in the fruits and veggies won't cause those GI distress. It's when they're added to other products. There's also a lot of non-digestible low-carbohydrate sweeteners that are used in um, different beverages, especially your sugar-free and low-fat beverages. And what's important is that they're not absorbed in the small intestine. They're really passed, you know, it, you know, um, not broken down into the large intestine, and there they get fermented. And that's where we can get that lower abdominal cramping and bloating and gas and diarrhea as a result. Okay. Another group that has become really a big talking point all across, you know, celiac disease, non-gluten sensitivity, and even some other food sensitivities, IBS and such, are the FODMAPs. But what are they? They are actually the short chain carbohydrates that are not digested or absorbed in the small intestine. They pass on to the, into the colon where they do uh, you know, attract more, more water into the colon and they ferment similar to those other sugars we just were talking about. Because of that, they also cause bloating, gas, diarrhea, abdominal distension, and gas. But what's important about the FODMAPs is that they are common in many of our natural foods. Fructans in particular are one of them that we see a link to many, many symptoms, G continued GI symptoms for our non-celiac gluten sensitivity patients, as well as our celiac patients that are on a good strict gluten-free diet, but are having repeated and persistent symptoms of gas and bloating. And we often find that the fructans, which are part of a fruct fructose group um, can be the can be the problem for that. They they do cause um, a lot of fluid, you know, drawing into the colon. It is a lot of um, gas and bloating that is often associated with the fructan, a high fructan um, intake. And in one study where they did a, a double blind placebo crossover, they found that 16% of those patients with celiac disease actually we had more symptoms to fructans even over their symptoms to gluten. So there was a higher reaction to fructan content of the diet than to the gluten content of the diet. So that the this is one FODMAP in particular that can cause a lot of GI complaints and stress. So when we look at the at the FODMAPs, the thing I want to point out is where some of those other um, ingredients that could cause a lot of distress, these we find the FODMAPs are really in a lot of the foods that we eat. So for example, you know, when we think of high FODMAP foods, your fruits like apples and mango and pears are all really high fructose content. You know, when we think of um, some non-animal based proteins like your beans and nuts and seeds, those are really high fructan content um, foods. And so we really, when we look at someone following a gluten-free diet um, for whatever reason, and they remain symptomatic and we've determined that it's not gluten that's causing it, we really need to look at the details of what they're eating to determine if the cause of ongoing symptoms may indeed be FODMAPs, sugar alcohols, or even just fiber. Important though, 
And one thing that um, is often forgotten with implementing a low FODMAP diet, even if we do it as a trial to see if we can reduce symptoms, is the procedure is one that needs to be really directed by a dietitian specialist. A low FODMAP diet is not a diet that we would recommend to stay on long term. The basic procedure is to really look at the person's intake and determine, are they really following a strict gluten-free diet? There's no high level of contamination. They're not misreading labels that really they're doing their best job. Once we do that and we see that there's continued symptoms, the first phase of the low FODMAP diet is a restrictive phase. So we take out all FODMAPs, which means an elimination of lactose, fructose, fructans, and polysaccharides, okay? We do that, we follow that restrictive phase for two to six weeks. If during that time, there's no improvement in, in symptoms, we stop the diet completely and just go back to the regular gluten-free diet. If there is an improvement in symptoms, then we go through the very detailed process of a re-challenge. And what the re-challenge is, is a very slow and systematic reintroduction of different high fat FODMAP foods by food group and by monitoring the portion size. So the foods are introduced slowly and in an incremental way. And then once we decide, you know, and the reason we do it very slowly and really watch carefully the different food groups and the portions that people are having is because then we can identify specifically the food group that is the trigger for those ongoing symptoms. Once we know what the, what the specific trigger is, then what we do is really personalize and customize that diet to that individual. And everyone is different. Their guts are different. And we really need to make sure that we're individualizing the diet because that will make the diet easier to follow and easier to stick with 100%. Okay. So the, with that approach, which is the general approved Monash um, approach to in, in to introducing the low FODMAP diet is that we look at that and we realize that's a time commitment. And we're really looking at spending three months or so on the restrictive phase, reintroducing, and really identifying those groups. Not everyone can do that. We worry about our patients that um, may have some maladaptive or some eating behaviors that would would potentially be triggered by having such a restrictive diet so that with that, we know that, that if we're concerned about those eating behaviors or potential eating disorders, the instead of doing that very long restrictive approach, we would do what's called a simplified plan, where we would take out the main foods from each of the FODMAP food groups and just monitor symptoms. Again, we would do some, you know, a challenge, but do it more gently, I guess is the best way to approach it. So one thing that's really important when we when we look at that reintroduction phase, whether it's on the simplified plan or the original plan, is that um, we have to look at portion size because many FODMAPs can be their reaction that a person has to it could be determined not just by the FODMAP group, but also by the serving size. And the best example I can give you for that is there's a bagel and there's a bagel. And if you live in New York City, the one on the larger one is what you would get, where if you're buying one out of the freezer section of the store that looks like a gluten-free bagel, that's the one on the other side. So that when we think, when we talk to our patients about how many of the FODMAPs are they having, we also have to really, really look at the amount and the stacking of it. Are they having not just a bagel, but are they also having a bean salad or other foods that are also high in the particular FODMAP group all at one meal or over the course of the day? And they may, we may find with many of our patients that if we can identify the group that's causing the trigger, small amounts may be well tolerated. We just have to be very cognizant of serving size and the stacking of too many of the same group within the same day. So the, our dietary advice in both the gluten-free and the low FODMAP diet is diet quality is imperative to, to really look at. We want to make sure that it's not just taking things out, but that we're adding the foods in that are going to provide nutrition, taste, variety, and break that burden 
of really that following the diet. The more things we can add, the easier it is to follow it. Grains like teff and millet and sorghum not only provide great nutrients, but great flavor and great diversity. When we think of teff, we can think of different cuisines. Ethiopian cuisine is based on teff flour, and that would allow people to enjoy dining out in a safe cuisine, but also giving them really good nutrition and flavor. You know, we also need to make sure that we're decreasing the amount of packaged processed foods. Yes, we need those easy meals for on the go. Yes, we need to be able to come home after a long day of work and get something on the table for every, for the family quickly. But as long as we're doing it as a filling in rather than a routine, that's the key. Um, we also need to make sure that we need to get fruits and vegetables in. And I encourage people, get to your farmer's market, eat seasonally, but think about when we're eating on that plate. Remember back in elementary school, where everyone said, okay, this is what you should eat. You should be eating this wonderful plate of a quarter of the plate should be protein, a quarter should be a grain, and half should be your fruits and veggies. What we often miss is that it should not all be white. It should be varied in color. You know, we really need to make sure that our gluten-free or low FODMAP diet provides that variety of color because the more colorful the diet is, the more nutrients we have in the diet too. We always tell, I always tell my pediatric patients, I want their plate to be a rainbow because that rainbow is gonna make sure that they're going to get the nutrition they need to grow. And the more diverse the diet is, the better for the microbiome and the waistline. And when we look at the, you know, some of the, the studies that have been done looking at the nutritional value of the diet, we can see from the Hallmark study done by Hallert many, many years ago to the one in Valletta and then to Kababi, it, it's we really see not only are there deficiencies in the gluten-free diet, but there's also excesses where uh, the initial study done by Hallert re really identified that you know, over half of the, the patients with celiac disease had signs of malnutrition. When he compared the actual dietary pattern, it was the same to the general population. But when we looked at those gluten-free products, they were devoid of fiber, folate, and thiamine. The later studies where we looked at, you know, from Valletta and from Kabani, is we found that not only were those gluten-free products low in nutrients, they were also excessive in the amount of sugar, salt, and fat. And so these are things we really need to look at when we're looking at that nutrition label. Yes, don't, you know, don't, you know, don't skip the ingredients, that's key. But we also wanna compare what is the amount of fat in that food? What is the amount of sugar? And to really think of those, those things to check as well. When we look at the diet, there's, this is a great study that was done in Italy where they compared the intake of individuals on a gluten-free diet to the general population. And interesting, they found that, if I can use my, use my little... Yep, here it goes. The general number of calories between those on a gluten-free diet and those in the general population was about the same. What was interesting is that the, oops, I'm sorry, let me go back. Um, nope. There we go. Okay, that the amount of, I apologize, the amount of carbo energy from carbohydrates in particular, carbohydrate, fat, fat, and sugar, that those vary great, statistically significantly different. So the amount of energy or calories from carbohydrates was lower for those on the gluten-free diet, but the amount of calories from sugar and from fat was significantly higher. We also need to look, think of those foods in terms of what's going on in our microbiome. We know that increased sugar and increased fat decreases the diversity in the microbiome. We really wanna make sure that we get fiber in the diet, less sugar and more fat to really cultivate a good healthy microbiome. And it's important because we're beginning to learn that the health of the microbiome affects not only um, your gut, but it also affects inflammation, and your brain, because there is such a big connection between the brain and the gut that we find that making sure that we're not only eating 
a good balanced diet for weight and for, you know, to be gluten-free, but we need to really cultivate the gut as well. You know, when we think of the, the gluten-free diet and the microbiome, there's been a couple studies and it, granted these are a little bit older, but there haven't been that many. We need to really do more here. We found that those individuals on a gluten-free diet, when they looked at the amount of the bacteria in the gut, that there was a decrease in the amount of what you would call the good or favorable bacteria and an increase in the bacteria that is associated with fermentation and, and, um, and bloating and gas. And we also, in the later study in 2018 by Hansen, he found that, that those, um, whether it's celiac disease or non-gluten sensitivity on a gluten-free diet, that there was a marked decrease once the patient went on a gluten-free diet in just overall bacteria, you know, numbers of bacteria in the gut. We also found that, you know, the good bacteria in particular was most effective. So what are our takeaways? Because I know we need to wrap up, but I want to send you with away with some pearls that really, you know, when we think of the diet, I want you to think of the diet differently. It's not just gluten-free. It's got to be good for you. So GFD is not just gluten-free diet, but it means it's good for everyone. Okay. One important thing, if you haven't already been started on the diet, whether it's non-celiac gluten sensitivity or celiac disease itself, please, please start with a specialized dietitian, someone who's really going to be able to teach you not just um, what to take out, but what to add in. And on the Celiac Association website, those 101s are, are, are fantastic. The ingredients, the label reading, those are the kinds of things that you really need. The basic gluten-free diet focuses on, you know, let's focus on naturally gluten-free food. Let's include all those fruits and vegetables. Let's include those alternative grains, but also let's individualize it. We need to, when we're thinking of it, let's not try to, you know, be Julia Child and cook a, a whole French dinner when you're working full-time and you have to make dinner for the kids. Let's make sure that it's something that's doable. We also need to look at what are your tolerances? What are your symptoms? Are there persistent symptoms? And then let's work with someone to really identify what the cause of those symptoms are. There are some recent studies that are really looking at the, at the gluten-free diet for those patients with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. There's a growing um, feeling that with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, there is a possibility to remove gluten for a period of time, allow the body to adjust, and then to re-challenge with gluten, and there may be improved tolerance. More, you know, again, more research needs to be done in this area, and we really need to look at if we reintroduce gluten after a challenge, um, do we need to monitor symptoms going forward? What we don't know yet is that we, we have seen this group of patients that have gone gluten-free for a number of years and are able to reintroduce it, but we need to follow them going forward to see if it needs to be removed again and need to really, you know, to Dr. Hogan's point, let's monitor what's happening neurologically as well. So the key takeaways today is gluten may not always be the cause of the symptoms. It could be other fructans, it could be FODMAPs, it could be fiber. So that when we think of doing gluten-free, let's do gluten-free really well and diverse, but also for having continued symptoms, let's look at what the other potentials are. Very important that we need to individualize the diet and not you know, start eliminating all groups of foods unnecessarily or eliminate foods long term without or without cause. So if you're having ongoing symptoms, don't just start taking out lactose, taking out soy in hope to find the cause. Work with the dietitian so we can really identify those. And individuals are more than just a diet. Don't let the gluten-free diet define you. Um, food and eating are very social. Being on a restrictive diet is tough. We need diet advice that will incor incorporate family traditions, culture, religious beliefs, favorite foods, how to dine out. And it's important to take those so that we can do the gluten-free diet well, you know, and, and succeed in life.
if you think that you might have FODMAP sensitivities, but the symptoms are tolerable, any like what are the long-term consequences of eating them? This person in particular is newly diagnosed celiac, but a vegetarian for 30 years. So eliminating further foods would be difficult, you know? It would be. And that's actually, I'm glad they raised the question because with our patients that are either celiac or non, non-celiac non gluten sensitivity, and you go on the gluten-free diet, if you're having continue, continued symptoms, we really say you need a time to allow the diet to work first. So before you start restricting other foods, let's give your body time to adjust to the gluten-free diet. Being vegetarian on top of following the gluten-free is a little bit trickier, but can be done. I have several patients that really do it very, very well. If FODMAPs are suspected, we really would need to make sure that we identify what the FODMAPs are, because I would hate to you know, eliminate that group of fructans and, and all those plant-based protein sources if indeed it's a fructose or a lactose issue rather than something else. So that's where it really requires, you know, kind of give yourself your body time to adjust to the gluten-free diet first, monitor symptoms, see if we can identify a, a, a trend or a trigger. Then if we suspect it is the FODMAPs, then let's do a, you know, a exclusion for a few weeks, see if we get symptom relief. If not, then we need to, you know, we need to look at fiber and all those other things. But I would hate to eliminate those good plant-based proteins unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A few questions on uh, sugars. So uh, we see lots of names for sugar, white sugar, cane sugar, refined sugar, raw sugar. Is there one that we should be seeking out? And like raw sugar sounds healthier, but is it just as bad for us in terms of being inflammatory? Um whatever you call it, it's still sugar. Okay. You know, raw sugar is just isn't bleached compared to the white sugar. Um, I don't want to villainize sugar, but I want to put a, uh, put a real caution on the amount. Okay. Cause when you're baking and, 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 and different forms of cooking, the sugar actually performs, you know, it, it's a, a it, it actually has a chemical role in the baking process to allow for some of that structure that we have. Um, it also is a good source of calories. So rather than saying no sugar, let's just say how much of it. When we compare the different types, there really isn't a big difference between white sugar and, and cane sugar or, or raw sugar. It's the amount of the processing. The whiter it is, the more refined it is, the finer the grain, the more processed it is. In that respect, the less processed may have some more trace nutrients. So using honey, maple syrup, or raw sugar may have some benefits. Thank you. And then on the sugar alternatives question, like stevia, Splenda, saccharin, you like, uh, like any specific recommendation for that? And then I know you talked about sugar alcohols and the digestive distress they can cause too. Is this related? And it is related. And when I think about, you know, again, you know, those sugar alcohols and even the sugar substitutes, there's a lot we don't know about them. And um, I would almost rather that a patient or a person would use a smaller amount of sugar because we know what that does. We, we know it, you know, will not harm the body. Too much sugar will decrease, you know, the, the good bacteria in the microbiome. But we really, the effect of those sugar alcohols and sugar substitutes long-term have not been well studied on their effect on the microbiome. If you can just reduce the amount of sugar, go without sugar, that would be my recommendation over the sugar alcohols or the substitutes. And in terms of like, if we do want to reduce sugar overall, the the bad boys uh, would, I know we hear about juice pop, like would those kind of be considered the worst category in terms of getting excess sugar that we you may not even realize? Actually, sugar is, added to so many things. I would actually, you know, pop is one that is an easy one to identify. Um, juices too, a lot of high fructose corn syrup added there, but also read your labels on your bread, your crackers, your cereals, because you may be surprised how much sugar is added to your morning breakfast cereal or your slice of toast. So that, you know, really, I would say it's not just the ones that's the pop and the juice, um, it, it really is added to many things. Um, mm -hmm. 
a, you know, your pasta sauce has sugar added to it. <laughs> so it's really across the board. So that's again, where as, as close to nature as you can get, kind of think farm to table, that's the best way to get the best nutrients with the least amount of additives in. Good advice. <laughs> um, shifting gears a bit, um, you talked about ancient grains. Uh, there was quinoa, but what other ones in particular were you referring to? Oh, there are so many fantastic grains. Um, some really easy ones. Quinoa is an easy one that's become almost more mainstream. Millet is a fantastic grain. It's often used in, um, grown in India, but it's light and fluffy. If someone used to enjoy couscous before being gluten-free, millet is your couscous replacement, okay? It cooks up nice and light and fluffy, but makes fantastic cold, cold salads and things. Other reason I recommend millet, it's very high in iron, so it's a natural source of iron. Sorghum is another grain that is often used in, as, a, as a flour in baking. It has a high protein content, has a little bit more folate in it, and you know the flour um, is very, very fine, so it lends itself to nice quality baking. Um, it's also great to use in soups and stews and such because it has the texture and the shape of barley. So if you're used to using barley before being gluten-free, the sorghum grain would be your replacement in that, that kind of nice hearty vegetable stew. Teff, I think I mentioned is native to um, Ethiopia. It's a very small, tiny, tiny grain. The flour is used to make a flatbread called injera. That's a fermented flatbread. Again, looking to in include those fermented foods, you know, to enhance the microbiome. But it has, it's used normally as a, like a hot cereal replacement for oatmeal um, or the flour in baking. Um, it has more of a nutty flavor to it. So I always think of it in terms of using the teff flour in like a quick bread or a brownie or something. It really lends itself to that. Mm. I know uh, teff, millet, sorghum flours are certainly healthy, but it can be difficult to find strictly gluten-free. Like there's gluten-free oats that are available, thankfully, but uh, for these flours, like we don't recommend people get gluten-free flours from the bulk bins in contaminated environments, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I realize you're in the United States, but uh, given your vast experience with Dr. Shah, any, any suggestions on finding safe sources of these flours? Yes, I would, I would actually say there's... Um an easy one that we find here and probably you can find it in Canada as well as the Bob's Red Mill um, company. They have a separate facility for their gluten-free grains and flours. And so that that's one that um, I feel confident with. Uh, many of their grains and flours have also been independently tested by gluten-free watchdog that have been found to be, to be safe. Um, other than that, no, no bulk bill, no bulk, bins and they they really need to be labeled gluten-free mm -hmm. agreed yeah do you have any general recommendations for someone with celiac disease on uh, probiotics multivitamins can these help actually we we don't recommend starting a multivitamin or a probiotic when you're first starting the diet because your your gut is is you know with celiac disease it's damaged with non-celiac gluten sensitivity it's inflamed so even if you added a multivitamin you're likely not going to absorb it at that point in time. We usually wait, retest someone's blood at, at six months and do a vitamin and mineral panel to identify those things that we need to add and then kind of add those things that we, we need. As much as we can, we'd really try to use diet as the source of those nutrients. So really highlighting, you know, adding seeds and nuts and those ancient grains to get in the vitamins that we tend to, to be lacking, like your B vitamins, your iron, your zinc, and those things. Um, a probiotic, you know, there was a study that um, our center did many years ago that actually identified some probiotics as being gluten containing. And um, as Dr. Hogan said before, let's, let's do a sourdough based uh, gluten-free bread have some kefir, have a yogurt, use some sour cream, look for your naturally fermented foods and include those in the diet. That's the best way to get those probiotics into your diet routinely. And now we, we in doing that, you're getting the benefit of the probiotic in that food, but you're also getting all those nutrients from the food too. And this will be our, our last question. Uh, so this is more down the road. Um, can you, do you know if your microbiome can be tested individually, like with the results to tell you where you stand? 
it can be not easily not, you know, again, kind of like looking at the TTG6. Um, it's it can be done either through uh, it's usually through a blood, blood sample or a stool sample. Um, certainly not covered by insurance, you know, here or in Canada, for sure. Um, it would need a specialty lab. But I think that that's something that, again, as we go forward and learn more about the, the need to look at the microbiome and its connection, you know, the brain gut connection and its connection to health, I think that these things may change over time. So that's my hope anyway, that we can really, you know, again, not only personalize the diet to an individual's lifestyle, but personalize it in terms of what they need um, from a very, you know, microbiome kind of level too. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee. Thanks for your flexibility and uh, staying with us uh, here. My pleasure. It's, it's just, it's always an honor to be part of this. <laughs>